Hello. Welcome to this Octave Day of Pentecost, also known as Trinity Sunday. Because it is Trinity Sunday, we are here at beautiful Trinity Church in the Anglican parish of South Queens. Today, we are also recognizing licensed lay minister Craig Condon and his graduation from Education for Ministry, or EFM. Craig, it would have been nicer if we had been gathered for this moment, for this threshold moment, a thin place between what's been and what's to be, between what's been studied, learned, and accomplished, and all the more there is to study and learn and do. It is so very good to mark growth and celebration, and then so very good as well to celebrate having further to grow. To note a mile marker on the longer way, and to take joy both in the distance traveled and the distance yet ahead. God, we ask that you bless this liminal time and space, and Craig and his fellow classmates who stand in thresholds looking back and looking ahead. Craig, may it be with a sense of both gratitude and anticipation. May it be with an awareness of how you can grow over your life with your whole person, in mind, body, spirit, and emotions. And may it be with a profound sense of what it means to place your way, where you've been and where you're going, within the way of Jesus. Our service on this Trinity Sunday will be one of Holy Communion, using the Book of Common Prayer, beginning on page 67. And to celebrate, to celebrate Craig, I have asked him to offer the message for today. So we begin with the comment. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us and write both these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose kingdom is everlasting and power infinite, have mercy upon the whole church. And so rule the heart of thy chosen servant, Elizabeth, our queen and governor, that she, knowing whose minister she is, may above all things seek thy honor and glory, and that we and all her subjects, duly considering whose authority she hath, may faithfully serve, honor, and humbly obey her in thee and for thee, according to thy blessed word and ordinance, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is with thee and the Holy, Holy Ghost, liveth and reigneth, ever one God, world without end. Amen. And our collect for today, Trinity Sunday. Almighty and everlasting God, who has given unto us thy servant's grace, by the confession of a true faith, to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity, and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the Trinity, we beseech thee, 
that this holy faith may evermore be our defense against all adver adversities, who livest and reignest, one God, world without end. Amen. We'll now have our first reading. The first lesson is written in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning at the first verse. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have domination over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, 
and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that everything he made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Here ended the first lesson. Today's psalm is Psalm 8, found on page 337. And Stephen and I will be reading this psalm by half verse. O Lord, our Governor, how excellent is thy name in all the world. Thou that hast set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of very babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemy. That thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heaven, even the work of thy fingers. The moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man? that thou art mindful of him. And the son of man, that thou visitest him. Thou hast made him but little lower than the angels. And dost crown him with glory and worship. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hand. And thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fishes of the sea, and whatsoever moveth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Governor, how excellent is thy name in all the world. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The second lesson is written in the 13th chapter of the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, beginning at the 11th verse. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of, Lord, the, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Here ended the second lesson. The Holy 
Gospel is written in the 28th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning at the 16th verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Praise be to thee, O Christ. And now we call upon Craig for his message. I share these thoughts with you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. First of all, I'd like to say it's good to be back with you, even, with just, even if it's just for these few minutes. And I look forward to the day where we can all be together again every Sunday morning. Today we celebrate not a religious holiday or occasion, but a doctrine, the doctrine of the Trinity. The Trinity is a concept that is not explicitly stated in Scripture, but it is there. The Trinity is a concept that is not easy to describe or understand. In fact, some ministers take Trinity Sunday off. The Trinity is referred to indirectly in the passage from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. All three members of the Trinity are always with us. They give us their cooperation and support. They help us and protect us. The name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit means the combined authority of all manifestations of God. When we are baptized, we receive the remission of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The one true God has a personality that is threefold and indicated by the relationship as Father and Son. It is indicated by a mode of being as a spirit. It is indicated by the various parts taken by the Godhead in manifestation and in the work of redemption. Jesus' resurrection proved that what he taught was correct. He used his ultimate authority when he gave the disciples and us the Great Commission. He showed his ultimate power by promising to be with us forever. When Christ rose from the dead, he created a new community with real change in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in action for all ages. When Jesus states that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth, he declares his ultimate authority. He is the recipient of God's authority. His deity is proved. As the creator, or God, he had the original right to do things. As the redeemer, or son, even more so. The phrase, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a strong affirmation of Trinitarianism. When he commissioned the disciples, Jesus instituted the threefold formula prior to the development of the Trinity. It holds Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together as three personae by whom God encounters us in his love from all eternity to all eternity. Since all three members of the Trinity are with us all of the time, we have the same authority Jesus had. We can bring God's truth to the world because of his divine authority. His world will prosper if we are faithful to his message. The Trinity allows us to make sense of the God who loves us enough to send Jesus to die for our sins. God who is God the Son is Christ, not dead. The risen God, who is God the Holy Spirit, is not Jesus gone, but Jesus present. So now that we have the Great Commission, what do we do with it? First, we must show Christ-like behavior, and that includes being righteous. In the Old Testament times, being righteous meant obeying the law of Moses perfectly, and that includes obeying the Ten Commandments. The Fifth Commandment is, do not murder. 
The Jews believed this referred to only the physical act of killing someone, but Jesus argued that there is a broader meaning. He argued that words and anger can kill. That is, they show the true heart of a person. Anger and words such as senseless, stupid, shallow, and the like violate the spirit of that commandment. If used, they may lead to a more open and dreadful infraction of that law. For example, 13-year-old Marcy had little use for her loud, obnoxious, smelly little brother. You're just a jerk, she yelled again and again. Her 10-year-old brother, Mike, didn't exactly like his older sister either. He would often fire back, you're really stupid. Their rivalry and toxic words polluted their home. God says it's wrong to insult, wound, tear down, cut up, threaten, or intimidate another person with our words. Hurtful words are hateful words. Jesus taught that it is more important to have a heart that is right than to conform to the outright act of worship. For example, if a person brought a gift to the altar and remembered that someone had something against him, he was to leave the offering on the altar and go and be reconciled. The worship of God will not be acceptable until we are at peace with anyone we have hurt or offended. Similarly, Christians are not to bring lawsuits against each other. We are encouraged to come to an agreement before going to court. God will see anyone who does not reconcile with those who have been offended as a violation of the commandment against murder, and he will punish them accordingly. Someone once asked Billy Graham, quote, If you ask God to forgive you for something you did to someone, does that mean you also have to ask them for forgiveness? I'm a Christian now, but I'm not sure I can do it. I don't see what difference it would make anyway, except maybe to open old wounds, end quote. In his reply, Billy Graham said the following words, quote, it is always important to seek the forgiveness of those we've hurt, even if it is hard to do. They might not forgive you, of course. They may reject your attempt or react with renewed anger over what you did. But then it becomes their problem, not yours. You will have done everything you could to let them know you regret what happened and that you want their forgiveness. Why is it important to seek the forgiveness of those we've hurt? For one thing, it could bring about reconciliation. After all, you were the one at fault. You alone are responsible for the hurt that resulted. But that hurt will only be healed if you seek to heal it and if the other person responds. End quote. Reconciliation with those we have hurt is not easy. One of the barriers is pride. No one likes to admit they were wrong because it is part of our sinful human nature. Pride is a sin that needs to be faced, dealt with, and confessed to God. If we have offended or hurt anyone, we need to make peace today. We must not put it off. When we reconcile with people we have hurt, our relationships will be healthier. In Christ, it is never too late for reconciliation. God wants us to live in peace with everyone by sincerely humbling ourselves and finding reconciliation through him. It is no secret that sin often leads to health problems. If we refuse to forgive, bitterness creeps into our hearts and plants roots. It can spread to those around us. If it hardens in our hearts, it is next to impossible to remove. Forgiveness depends on us. Reconciliation is the ideal to work towards, but sometimes it is not possible. It depends on both parties. What others do is their choice. What we allow them to do is up to us. We are responsible only for our own actions. When we ask others to forgive us, we have an opportunity to fulfill the Great Commission. The Great Commission has not changed since the moment Jesus uttered it. Christians are to, quote, go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey, end quote. They are to accomplish all of this by his power and for his sake through the, his spirit. 
When followers of Jesus are slow to share their faith or pour into the lives of others, it is often because they do not really take Jesus at his word when he says, quote, I am with you always, end quote. It isn't easy for us to remember that the members of the Trinity are always with us. Sometimes we're so blinded by disappointment that we can't see Jesus walking with us throughout heartache and leading us to something better ahead. The Trinity shows us that there is a way for us that leads far beyond disappointment. The Trinity proves that we are in the presence of someone who cares, who leads, who has authority and wisdom. All three members of the Trinity encourage us to get going. They are with us all of the time. So we have a life that is exciting and full of confidence that the members of the Trinity have done all things properly for us. Life with the Trinity is to be lived with their gifts and their blessing. When we read and study scripture, when we are baptized into faith, when we take part in Holy Communion, it's like receiving a kiss of grace from the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is a confession, not a definition. Who can define God? We can only confess our history and personal encounters with God. To confess God apart from Christ is impossible. To confess Christ apart from God, the creator of everything, is impossible. To confess God in Christ apart from our experience, both, both through the Holy Spirit sustaining the church, is impossible. All we can do is confess our faith in the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you for your homily, Greg. We celebrate your accomplishments today. We give blessings to you for all that you have achieved and many more achievements yet to come. One part of your life's journey is complete. You are now ready to begin another phase that will take you to places yet unknown. As you prepare for your next journey, we hope that you remember your EFM leaders and peers who have been companions over these past four years. We give you blessings of goodwill and Christian love as you use what you have learned to share the Word of God with others. We pray your courses will help you faithfully fulfill the duties of your ministry to build up God's church and to glorify God's name. May what you have learned, along with the Holy Spirit, be a beacon to guide you on your path as you continue in the way of Christ. We pray that God will give you strength and determination to grow in relationship with him and to develop new relationships that will help to strengthen and sustain your faith. Because we are made in the image of God, we have been blessed with free will to make choices and decisions. We pray that you make wise and rational decisions, always turning to God for help. God hears, God listens, God is always with you. Do not forget that. Always keep in mind that God is around you and within you. If you turn to God, God will guide you. Just as Jesus commissioned the disciples to go out and spread his word with the world, so do we commission you to do the same, not only in the church, but in the way you live your life. Always keep Christ in your heart. We send you forth with love, with reverence, with preservation, and with support. Strive for only the best life has to offer you, and may the love of Christ shine through you. Christ is the light of all people. Let him shine in you during tough times, 
And always keep that light alive. Let Christ's light shine always. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And now we continue on page 71.